Well, thank you very much for your attention. This is a joint work with several colleagues, uh, from colleagues from, from the Central Bank of Chile, uh, as, as Elias mentioned. And the usual disclaimer applies here. Opinions and conclusions expressed in these papers are ours alone and do not necessarily represent the official views of the Central Bank of Chile or any of its board members. So we are going to talk about global drivers and macroeconomic volatility in emerging markets economies, or EMEs, as we are going to refer to them through the presentation, with a dynamic factor, general equilibrium perspective. Global factors have received a lot of attention in the literature. They have been pointed as important drivers of macro fluctuations in, in EMEs, in particular, in small and open economies. Recent works have associated or linked these factors to or with global financial conditions, commodity prices, changes in, in sovereign risk, um, global growth factors, among others. But the debate is, is still open regarding at least the nature of these global forces and the transmission mechanism through which they end up impacting emerging market economies. So how do we contribute to this discussion with this paper? Well, here we aim at identifying the most relevant global forces for EMEs and understanding the way they are interrelated. We also aim at uh, exploring the specific channel through which these forces affect and shape this uh, economy's business cycle. And we do this in two steps, basically. First, we estimate a global dynamic factor model using a broad set of data for, uh, from a group of 12 mainly commodity exporting uh, EMEs over the last 20 years. We also include several variables from this economy's main trade partners, including both advanced and emerging economies. And we include additionally international prices in goods and financial markets. In this first stage, and based on our identification assumptions, we allow for three global for factors, forces to coexist and interact. First, a financial factor. Second, a price global factor and third, a growth global factor. But then there is a second stage. And in order to evaluate the transmission mechanism and, and, and the quantitative relevance of these global factors uh, on, on, on domestic economies, as well as the implications for monetary policy, we uh, zoom into the Chilean economy. What we do is we embed the estimated structure of the dynamic factor model as another layer of the large scale DSG model used regularly at the Central Bank of Chile for policy analysis and uh, forecasting. And through the lenses uh, of the DSG model, we analyze this mechanism. So what are our results? What do we find? Well, first we see that the three global factors that we estimate show strong commitment. There is a high interaction among them and there is a particular preponderance of the financial factor affecting the two other factors. Second, these factors explain an important share of uh, EMEs business cycle and global commodity prices, especially the financial and the price factors. But they also make a very good job actually explaining the dynamics of the main advanced economies included in, in, in our sample. We find that shocks to the financial shock uh, factor, sorry, induce a sort of risk on episode where growth in EMEs rises and prices increase. Um, and these shocks end up explaining the most significant part of the variance in global variables. But for the EMEs uh, that uh, we analyze, shocks to the price factor, which we interpret as uh, cost push shocks are uh, especially relevant as we will see. A third result that we uh, highlight here is that we find that the analysis for Chile, uh, for when we analyze the Chilean economy through the lens of the DSG model, um, we gain understanding of why price, the price factor actually uh, has a preponderant role for EME's business cycle. And this is basically because well, a shock to the global financial factor triggers reactions in, in global variables that move the domestic economy in, in opposing directions. But the contrary happens when, when a global price shock uh, takes place. Uh, these offsetting effects of the domestic variable is not present, and most transmission channels are actually end up pushing in the same direction. This implies that the monetary policy 
should respond more, more, more actively in the presence of this type of global shocks relative to the reaction to global financial, uh, financial shocks. So here a brief uh, outline. We had our introduction. Now we'll move to present and discuss our dynamic factor model, and then we'll analyze the transmission mechanism of the estimated global factors into EMS. Well, let's move to the dynamic factor model. The, the, the state space representation of our uh, dynamic factor model is very simple and very general. Equation one here is our uh, measure equation, where yt is the vector of observed macroeconomic variables, which is expressed in the equation as a linear function of a vector of an observed factor, f, and a vector Shocks Q is the item. We estimate our model using an unbalanced quarterly panel data set between 2002 and 2018 for a set of 12 mostly commodity exporting EMEs. We also include in the data set some macro variables of these uh, EMEs top trade partners. And we include additionally global prices of the top commodities exported by these emerging economies. For simplicity, we organize our data. This is the, the yt uh, vector of observables in the dynamic factor model into, into two groups, a set of what we call EME variables uh, that includes data on GDP, CPI, MB, spreads, and, and a major stock market index for each of the 12 EMEs in the sample. We have here 48 series uh, the, uh, and a set of global variables that includes these EMEs most relevant external variables, and that's why we name them global variables. And here we have the EMEs import price indexes, C, uh, GDP, CPI, and exchange rate of the top uh, trade partners, global prices of the top commodities exported, and an estimation of the US shadow Fed fund rate. Now we have a diverse data set. If we consider both group, the EME variables and the global variables, we end up including 20 GDP series that account for about 80% of the world GDP. Now, we have this relatively simple dynamic factor model and a very diverse data set. And as we mentioned, we uh, would like to understand the nature of the global forces affecting the, these EMEs uh, in, 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 the, in the sample. So, the problem is that it's not a problem, but the, the point is that the model is silent or, or does not allow for a, for a structural interpretation of the estimated factor in, the, in its general specification. So what we do is to introduce some parameter constraints that allow us to name ex ante the, the factor. In practice, what we do is set to zero some of the entries of the loading uh, factor loading matrix, which is somehow depicted or illustrated here. This is the gamma matrix, remember? Uh, and in this way, through these restrictions or constraints, we actually limit or block the contemporaneous effect of some of the factors on particular variables. The table here uh, show how we actually introduce these uh, restrictions in the factor loading matrix. Rows, you just have to, to understand the table, each row uh, represent a, a particular type of measure equation, and each column uh, represents uh, a factor that we estimate. Thus, uh, each of the entries in the, in the, in the matrix uh, represent a particular loading for a given factor in a, a given uh, equation. White, white circles refer to entries in the loading matrix that are set to zero, and black circles are the unconstrained, unconstrained uh, entries. So the point is, when we set to zero a particular loading, what we are doing is basically uh, not allowing the factor to impact contemporaneously on the uh, observed equation. For example, here, this is a zero in the matrix. The price factor then is not allowed to impact contemporaneous, 
on, on GDP of the emits. The specific constraints that we impose and the factors that we then name after uh, these constraints are consistent with the factors identified in, in, the, in the literature, that the ones that we just mentioned in, in the introduction. We end up estimating three factors, a global fi uh, or, or financial factor, primarily associated with uh, financial data, that is stocks, MVs, exchange rates, and the shadow Fed fund rate, but also associated with activity and price data. We also estimate a price factor here, primarily associated to CPIs and uh, global commodity prices, and a growth factor, finally, that is basically associated or linked to GDPs, both of EMEs and their trade partners. We estimate the model in log differences, um, except for the Fed fund rate are MBs that enter the, the modeling first differences. So here we have, we have the, 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 the factors. Uh, we present them in, in levels, which are obtained the accumulation of the original estimated factor. Remember the factors are estimated in log differences. We accumulate them, we accumulate them, and we uh, uh, plot them here. <laughs> And we also, uh, so the black lines are, are, are the, the, the factors and the, the bars, the color bars are uh, basically the, 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 the historical shock decomposition of each of them. What we see here is that first, there is a strong co-movement among factors and there is actually a strong dynamic correlation, dynamic co-movement between these estimated factors. As we can see here from the cross serial uh, correlation in the figure in, in the bottom left. The, co the correlation actually goes up to 7.75 for some of these uh, series, the cross series. The second feature that we highlight here is the high interaction among factors. And we see that from the fact that there are several colors, the three colors actually show up in all three, behind uh, all three factors. Blue colors, which are financial shocks, actually are relatively more preponderant. Uh, this is the other. Uh, feature that we highlight, the preponderance of the financial factor, which goes in line with the high interaction that they show. Uh, shocks actually to, to the financial uh, factor explain, uh, when we look here in, in the table, this is the unconditional uh, variance decomposition of, of, of factors. Uh, we, we see that the financial shock explain about three quarters of, of, of the financial factor itself, but also 42% of the price factor and 35% of the growth factor. The price factor is also relevant. It explains 24, almost 25% of the financial uh, shock, the variance of the financial shock, 30, more than 50% of its own variance and 37% uh, of the growth um, factor, the variance in the growth factor. So how do we interpret these factor shocks? Where here we have uh, uh, the impulse response a function to shocks uh, to the financial factor in blue and the price factor in, in orange. For each macro variable here, GDP, inflation, MB, and so on, we report the median IRF among exclusively the 12 EMEs in our data set. What we can see here is that a shock to the financial factor, again, the blue lines, is associated with a risk on, a risk on type of episode, uh, or a sort of relaxation of the global financial condition that induces positive responses in stock market indices, a uh, fall in sovereign risk, an increase in, price, in prices of, of, of commodities, and also higher growth and higher inflation in, in, in these EMEs. Shocks to the price factor, the orange lines, uh, have relatively different effects. Uh, they can be interpreted as cost push shocks or negative global supply side shocks. Um, in, in which import prices and inflation increases, uh, increase, uh, economic activity actually slows down a little bit, uh, stocks and commodity prices fall, and sovereign risk actually rise after these uh, shocks. How relevant are these shocks, in particular the shocks to the financial conditions and to global prices, and, and how they end up impacting on uh, the EMEs uh, variables. So what we do here is we present the observed variables and conditional forecast error uh, variance decomposition. So for each of the equation, we have the median 
of the explained variable, uh, a variance, sorry, uh, for, for the particular group. If we look at, at this uh, first group, the e and &E variables, what we see is that shocks to the three global factors in the last column uh, account for more than 38% of uh, the variance in GDP, in the EME uh, GDP, a quarter of the variance in MBs, and almost two thirds of the variance in, in stock uh, indices. They don't do a great job explaining uh, inflation in, in EMEs, only 9%. When we look at the explained variable, uh, explained variance for, for global uh, variables, we see a lot of action as well. All three factors end up explaining 39% of GDP for trade partners, 43% of CPI, for almost 49% of, um, sorry, for, uh, yeah, for uh, the exchange rate uh, variation in, in, for this group of, of variables. Shocks uh, to these factors also contribute to an important fraction of the moving in, in commodity prices, almost 30% on average. But if we focus on crude oil, copper, and uh, aluminum, which are the most uh, relevant uh, commodities in this group of countries, uh, they explain almost two thirds of the, of the variance. But the table here also allows us to, to appreciate that uh, the individual effect of each of the, of the factor shocks uh, on, on, on the on the different uh, on the different variables. Um, not surprisingly, if we look at the financial shocks, uh, they explain a lot of the financial variables, but they also explain a lot of the non-financial variables, the GDP and inflation of trade partners in particular, I highly exp explained by, by, by these shocks. However, when we look at, at EMEs, we see that for GDP and CPI in particular, the price, the factor shocks are the most uh, relevant, marginally more relevant. We will analyze a little bit more this result with the DSG model. A question that arises is what is behind the, the, the financial factor? We have seen that the financial factor explains a lot, is very prominent, um, but we have also seen that, okay, this factor, even though uh, affect, is, the, is the only factor that affects financial variables, it also affects other non-financial variables. So the name of financial factor could be easily questioned. Well, here in the figure uh, on the left, we plot the cyclical component of our accumulated financial factor, along with the global financial factor estimated by Miranda, Agrippino, and Ray 2020, uh, which they actually extract for more than 800 asset and, and commodity price series. We also include in the same figure, the commodity price factor estimated by Andres Fernandez and co-authors in their 2018 paper, which is estimated using commodity prices exclusively. In the right hand side of the figure, we uh, compare our financial factor with other relevant financial variables the SP 500, the US 10 year break even inflation, and even the Brent oil uh, price. So we interpret this strong resemblance between our estimated factor and uh, this other series as indicative of a financial nature of the factor. But beside this graphical interpretation, there might still be concern that our financial factor is just capturing global economic activity. Remember that we have a lot of GDP of the world in this sample. So it might be simply that this global factor is capturing this dynamic of, G of global GDP. So what we do in one of our robustness is to basically close this financial factor GDP channel. So we set, we, include, we set to zero this and these entries in the loading matrix. And in that way, we basically don't allow the financial factor to impact contemporaneously on GDPs, nor the EMEs, nor uh, the, the, the trade partners. Um, here we see the, the result, the estimated the factor. These are the estimated just as they come in, in log differences. It is very interesting that there are actually no differences for the estimation of the financial and price factors, which are virtually the same as in the original specification. But there are some changes for the estimation of the growth factor as expected. And these changes actually make the growth factor to look more uh, the, the, like the financial uh, factor. The, the correlation between the growth factor and the financial factor increases from 0.53 in the original estimation to 0.67 in this alternative specification. 
So in the end, we interpret these uh, results as, an, uh, uh, that, as a proof that the identification of our financial factor does not require the contemporary information provided by, by GDP. All the information seems to be already captured by the financial variables and price. At the same time, we somehow confirm that the financial factor indeed informs GDP uh, in, a, in a contemporaneous way. So, okay, let's let's go go back and, and move on. So we now arrive to the second part of our paper. We don't have much time. I, I try to move uh, faster. Now we dig uh, deeper into the, the channels uh, through which the global factors affect emerging market economies. To do this, we build on a large scale DSG model estimated for Chile. And we add to this model, the estimated structure of the dynamic factor model as an additional uh, block. As we have seen, the dynamic factor model allows us to, to estimate the factor, we've seen that, to estimate their shocks and, and see how, what, what is the final effect of these shocks on uh, the, 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 the observed variance. However, the model is silent with respect to the specific mm, transmission mechanism through which the factors affect local economies. Uh, so what we do here is using this augmented DSG model is to disentangle these effects, uh, how these effects end up uh, playing a role on each particular local uh, variable. So a key, a key point here, a key question that we, we could answer with, with this analysis is the fact that, okay, we saw that for EMEs, uh, uh, GDPs and inflation, price shocks seem to be more relevant than financial shocks. We, while well, the financial shock is, is the most relevant driving force behind the other global uh, variables and, and, and trade partners, GDPs and, and inflation. So here through the lens of the DSG model, we can move uh, and, and understand a little bit more about that. What, what is going on? So here we have uh, our DSG model estimated for the Chilean economy. The details are not provided here. You can find them in the, in, in the Garcia et al. 2019 paper. The model, this is actually the, the, the one that the Central Bank of Chile uses regularly for forecasting and, and policy analysis. The model considers a local economy and an external sector because local economy interacts with the rest of the world in two dimensions, with, in the real sector by importing and exporting goods and services, and in the final sector by trading bonds and international markets. The link between the external and the domestic blocks is through different six different channels, which are actually external variables, namely the main trade partners, uh, GDP and prices, the prices of copper, which is the main uh, commodity exported by Chile, and oil, which is the main commodity imported by Chile, an import price index, and an indicator of external financial conditions. Those are the, the mechanism or the, the channel through which Global external global forces affect the domestic economies. In the original DSG model, which is depicted here in the left, uh, on the left of, of the figure, uh, we see that the external variables here, the green circles, are assumed to be orthogonal and they have only direct effects on the domestic economy, which are illustrated with green arrows. In the augmented DSG model, on the other hand, which includes the factors the, or the structure that we import from the dynamic factor uh, model, we see that these global factors, in this case, the orange and purple ones, the A and B respectively, affect the domestic economy through their effects on these external variables. And there are both direct and indirect effects of them as we, uh, we can see them through uh, with the uh, orange and purple arrows here. These factors actually, the, 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 the common, the, 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 the Shocks to these factors, since they are interrelated, uh, they induce some co-movement as well in the external uh, variables. And with this structure, the model allows us then to measure the effects uh, of factor shocks, global factor shocks, separately, analyzing the, the different channels as we turn on and off each of them, uh, and, and, and how they end up impacting on the local economy. As an example, brief here, consider uh, assume that the, the, the orange factor is the financial one and the purple is the, is the price factor. And let's say this is this external variable is, is the copper price and this is oil price. So we could see, we, we could imagine how a shock to the financial factor here has an a direct impact on copper and oil prices, which is uh, illustrated with the orange lines here. 
but also the, the, the shocks affect the, the price factor, which in time, in turn, affect through these other two orange lines, copper and oil prices, respectively, and they both end up impacting on the domestic economy. So here we have the shocks and the IRF that they induce. Uh, we consider a one standard deviation shock to the financial factor, and we focus here on the local. Uh, sorry, how, how much time do I have? It's two minutes. You, you have uh, five minutes. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Elias. Uh, so we have a one standard, one standard deviation shock to the financial factor. And we focus here on the effects, on, particular effect on GDP levels and headline inflation uh, in Chile. See through the lens of this, of this model. The, the, the final IRF, uh, IRF are the, the black lines, but in, 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 in the color bars, we have somehow partial IRF. Uh, that is the effect that uh, the, the, the financial shock uh, induces on, on GDP and headline inflation through each particular channel, which are mentioned here. Foreign GDP, external financial costs, oil prices, and, and so on. So what we have here, more, very briefly, uh, effects of the financial factor shock, the copper price increase actually, so ends up having a, a, an important positive effect on, G, on, on, on Chile's GDP, ends up appreciating the, the exchange rate as well and pushing inflation uh, down, oil prices increase as well. That impacts negatively uh, the Chile's GDP, but positively headline inflation, of course. Uh, import prices increase, um, and there, well, you, you, I, I'm not going to go through all the, 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 the specific channel, but but the point is, as, as, as we look at, at here, for example, yeah, at import prices increasing. Uh, increasing the, the, the cost of imported goods, affecting negatively inflation, increasing inflation, uh, positively inflation and negatively GDP. We see trade partner inflation increasing as well. Trade partner growth increases as well and exchange rates appreciating and sovereign risk falling. So we don't have much of an effect of these last two, two variables. Um, but the point is that there is a lot of variation induced by each particular channel and the final effect ends up being in between, given that some of these effects go in one direction and some of the other go in the other direction for both GDP and headline inflation. If we go and analyze at the effects of a price shock uh, instead, we see that uh, copper price decrease, oil price decreases here, import prices increase, trade partners inflation decrease, trade partners growth decrease and the exchange rate depreciate and sovereign risk increase. So there, there are mixed effects all over the place. But the, the, the point here is that even though the individual variance induced by, by each of these channels is relatively lower or smaller than the ones that we register for the financial shock, uh, when we add up all of them, we uh, have a very negative effect on GDP level and are strictly positive uh, effect on, on headline inflation, because basically most of these channels point or go, go in the same direction. When we analyze the, the, the effects on, on monetary policy responses, we see in line with the reaction of, of inflation, that there is little inflation in the, when we have fi a financial price, uh, financial uh, factor shock, therefore little reaction in the monetary policy rate. There is more inflation, as a consequence of a price uh, shock, and therefore a stronger and more active reaction in the monetary policy rate. And behind the the dynamic of the monetary policy rate, we can see we, we, we can see what is what is playing uh, or, or moving things are, uh, or driving this this result. In in the right uh, graph, we see the monetary policy response and conditional forecast error variance decomposition, and we see again that even though the variance explained by each individual the factor is uh, larger for the financial shock. And even though if we add up all of them, the effect is significantly higher in terms of how, how much variance we, we explain with, this, with these shocks in comparison to the price shock. The fact that the covariance plays a, a different roles in each case um, drive the, end, end up driving the, the result. 
we have negative covariance here of, of these uh, effects, and therefore very little reaction in, in monetary policy. And we have a positive reaction, a positive covariance here that actually reinforces the, the need for an increase in the monetary policy. Right. So ending our presentation, here we have uh, analyzed the role of global drivers on business cycles uh, of EMEs. We do this first by estimating a set of global factors and analyzing their nature. And here we highlight as a key feature of the analysis, the identification of multiple external forces by means of a constrained dynamic factor model. We find empirical support for the relevance of a global financial factor followed by global price factors as well in, in, in EMEs. We end up embedding our empirical factor structure as an additional layer in Chile's central bank of uh, DSG model and the analysis through the DSG model suggests that there is a relevant there are re relevant implications for monetary policy, uh, in particular uh, in the presence of uh, price shocks uh, that in, induce at least through the model strong monetary policy reaction in comparison to other sort of relevant shocks as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>